This is CBC Here and Now. As of today, Tuesday, March 17th, there are three presumptive positive cases of COVID-19 in Newfoundland and Labrador. Two more presumptive cases of COVID-19 in the province, both connected to the first. We were offering deliveries and pickups and stuff, and we even started doing like a no contact delivery situation. Big changes for stores and restaurants as a new way of doing business sets in. Well, the number of cases of coronavirus is on the rise in this province. There are now three people who have COVID-19. The medical officer of health confirmed the numbers this afternoon. Peter Cowan is live tonight with the details. So Peter, what can you tell us about these new cases? Carolyn, the new people, uh, it's both a man and a woman, and they all had close contact with that first woman who we saw who came back from a cruise. But let's take a look at some of those numbers. So we now do have three cases, uh, and all three of those are in the Labrador Grenfell region, but they're not revealing the exact communities for the privacy of the people involved. Uh, and there were, we're also seeing a lot more people being tested. Now almost 500 people have been tested. Obviously, the vast majority of those are being negative. The warning today, though, is these new measures that we're talking about, the social distancing, the businesses shutting down, we're going to be in it for the long term. This will not <clears throat> be a short-term situation. With that said, we are prepared and the system is working well and as it should under these pressures. Thank you to organizations and businesses that have already voluntarily shut down services. Our recommendation is that public spaces should be closed. This would include businesses such as gyms, fitness facilities, including yoga classes, bars, cinemas, performance spaces, and arenas. We also recommend that St. Patrick's Day celebrations for this evening be canceled. We recommend restaurants reduce capacity by 50% to allow adequate social distancing. Takeout orders, deliveries, and drive-through services can continue to operate and should be encouraged if people choose to use the restaurants. Restaurants should not be offering buffet service. People have been asking about mass gatherings and previous guidelines have given you numbers. As things evolve, the message is that we want to keep you and your loved ones safe. My message is to avoid gatherings where you cannot keep a distance of two arm's lengths from others. And that can be a, a gathering as small as 10 people. Now, what about the things that you can do? Dr. Fitzgerald did specifically mention uh, going outside, playing in the backyard, going for a walk or a snowshoe. These are all good things that you can continue to do as long as you can kind of maintain two arm lengths away from other people, you can continue to have those social interactions. So she's discouraging, uh, especially now the kids are home, uh, sleepovers or play dates or anything where you're going to see people come back into uh, close contact with one another. Uh, but she, a lot of people are wondering, okay, as things have been tightening, what's the next step? What is she looking out for? And she gave us some of her insights on that today. At the moment, what we see are, with our case here in particular, we've seen household contacts that have been affected, and those are not unexpected. So if we were to start seeing cases where we were not able to trace back to either travel or a contact, that would be concerning for us, certainly. The other key thing that Dr. Fitzgerald is looking for is how well do people abide by the recommendations to close things down, the recommendation for anyone who's traveled internationally to self-isolate for 14 days. As long as people continue to do that, she says they won't have to bring in stronger, more enforcement measures in order to make sure that happens. Carolyn? Thanks so much, Peter. That's here now. It's Peter Cowan reporting live. Well, today's new cases of COVID-19 brings the total up to 451 cases across the country. There have also been five deaths in Canada, the latest announced today in Ontario. A 77-year-old man died in hospital in Barrie. He had contracted the virus after coming in contact with an infected person. He was a suspected case, but not confirmed. He tested positive for COVID-19 after his death. 
And the prime minister again addressed the nation today from outside his temporary residence at Rideau Cottage. Justin Trudeau, like many Canadians, is self-isolating and pressing the importance of social distancing. Our doctors and nurses need your help. Your neighbours need your help. Vulnerable people <clears throat> in the community need your help. As much as possible, stay home. Don't go out unless you absolutely have to. Work remotely if you can. Let the kids run around a bit in the house. Things will get better. Thanks to our outstanding public health professionals, we have the information we need to make informed choices. So if you can, send an email or pick up the phone instead of meeting in person. Order takeout instead of going out to dinner. And try to support your neighbours and friends if they're worried or need help. Well, municipalities in the province are starting to lock down in the wake of COVID-19. Metro area councils have decided to halt some services as more cases of the virus surface in the province. Here now as Meg Roberts joins us live. So Meg, what can you tell us about that? Carolyn, lots of updates tonight as municipalities start to take action on trying to combat the spread of this virus. The city of St. John's has announced that there will be no curbside recycling for the next two weeks. All public meetings and events are canceled. Recreation facilities are closed and council meetings are closed to the public but will be streamed online. Critical services will continue, which includes garbage collection, snow clearing and wastewater treatments. Now, the mayor of St. John's acknowledged this year has already been particularly tough for businesses. He says it's the province decision, not the city's, to shut down those spaces. The mayor says he has a telephone call with mayors from across the country, as well as the deputy prime minister this evening, where he will be asking the federal, federal government to quickly send assistance from the state of emergency in January. We feel that that support should be rolled out quickly and, uh, and, uh, and should be very fluid. In, in how it's done. Uh, we need the assistance, our businesses and individuals need the assistance now. And uh, I want to work with our, our other mayors across the country to make sure that uh, that, that, uh, that that assistance is flowing. Mount Pearl, CBS and Paradise have all announced similar restrictions, closing all city facilities and buildings, including city and town halls. Now garbage collection will also go ahead, but recycling will be suspended. Working from home is now a priority for all of the metro area municipalities. The Metro bus will also be suspending certain morning peak hour routes as of Friday, and the mayor says they also are not sitting the first row of seats and no one is allowed to stand. There also has been an increase in disinfecting efforts. Carolyn. Thanks, Meg. That's here now's Meg Roberts reporting live. Well, the list of cancelled events keeps growing. The East Coast Music Awards planned for St. John's at the end of April is now cancelled. The organizers say over the next few weeks they'll look for other ways to celebrate the accomplishments of the winners. So how do stores and businesses serve customers as the province essentially shuts down? Here now's Andrew Hawthorne has this report on what some businesses are doing. It could almost be a regular day at Coleman's in St. John's. Almost. But there are changes here as Coleman's deals with a COVID-19 shutdown to protect its staff and customers from the coronavirus. Last week, this was a salad buffet, now pre-packed and sterile. This morning, Coleman's started its early morning shopping hour for seniors and at-risk groups. We're really working hard with our staff. They've worked tirelessly, not just to keep the store clean, uh, sanitized every morning and throughout the day, but with our self-serve counters, we're taking that extra step to uh, have staff to come in, pre-pack salads, meals, and that sort of thing, all designed around health and safety, but also about accessibility. And your veggies. We've got chickpeas, uh, lentils. At Curry Delight in Mount Pearl, the restaurant has completely altered its business model around safety. Like many operating in the city, they've closed their dining room to all but takeout. Despite the changes, business has been steady. We accommodated the request and started like a no contact delivery kind of thing. So we just leave it at their doorsteps or wherever they would like us to pay. And the payments are accepted via email transfers. So that helps in um, making sure that our, them and us, like we just haven't had come in contact with anything. 
With schools closed, a small business owner like Afia must now divide her time between children and work. For a small business, it's a question of survival. Of course it's going to affect us. We went through a little bit of that when the snowmageddon happened, so we do, we're kind of like hoping that, you know, things get better, but again, it's the health and safety of everyone. Our families, our customers' families, like it's our, the staff, that's the, the utmost importance. As many companies reduce hours and move to a work-from-home model, it's forcing them to come up with new ways of doing business to serve their customers while keeping everyone safe. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew Hawthorne. CBC News, St. John's. All right, so in the spirit of social distancing, Ashley is working from home today and joins us now through FaceTime. So Ashley, uh, there's some active weather headed our way, right? Yes, we uh, had an absolutely gorgeous day for most of us across the province. We did see some increasing cloud. We're starting to see that now as I look out the window. I can see those clouds uh, are starting to move in and they will continue to do so as we head through the overnight. We do have some snow on the way, mainly for the south coast. That should change over to rain for the majority of the island as we head into the day tomorrow. Temperatures on the way up. I'll have all those details in your full forecast when I come back. Carly? Thanks, Ashley. We'll check in with you again a little bit later. Well, the school district has changed its plans uh, regarding closures. No students will be allowed to enter into their school. Now, yesterday, the district said students could return to school tomorrow and Thursday to pick up their materials, but now it's locking schools down. Neither students nor parents will be permitted to enter. The only exceptions will be to get critical items like medical equipment or prescriptions. The board says it doesn't want to discourage gas gathering and encourage social distancing. Parents will have to contact school staff to arrange any pickups. Well, a student at Holy Heart School in St. John's wants to stay in St. John's. He's one of five Italian exchange students in the province who've been told they'll soon have to go home. As Mark Quinn reports, that would mean returning to Milan, the epicenter of the European outbreak. Yes, a lot of people are sick. Eduardo Spinoza has been keeping in touch with his family in northern Italy. Of course, they've been talking about COVID-19, and the news in Milan hasn't been good. Uh, I know some people that are infected. Fortunately, not my family. Milan was the first place in Europe hit hard by the new coronavirus. Almost 30,000 people have been infected in Italy, and more than 2,000 of them have died. I'm anyway afraid for my family, for my friends, but I don't know how me back home can help them. Spinoza says he's fallen in love with Canada and he's been flourishing in St. John's as a key player on the Holy Heart Highlanders. But the AFS Intercultural Programs group that brought Spinoza to Canada now says he'll have to go home. Spinoza believes he's safer here. In Italy is not the moment for going to Italy. It's not the moment for take two planes and go in Italy. Spinoza has been trying to find a way to stay in Newfoundland for at least another four months. His family here and his family in Italy want that too. We've asked ASF to comment, but haven't heard back from them yet. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, parents and children in this province woke up to a whole new world this morning. It was the first day without public school in what could become an extended closure. That means parents are trying to figure out just what to do. Here are now's Garrett Berry reports. Welcome to morning one of a suspended life. What's going on? Schools, gyms, after school programs, all canceled and closed. But not this. Oh, uh, I get to play with my friends a lot. A lot of my friends play this game. And so that's who's on the phone. You're talking to your friends while yeah. you play. Yeah. Today, take what you can get. And that you have to stay away from, from as many people as possible right now. So, I don't know. Thank you, Xbox. And thank you, PlayStation, maybe. <laughs> I know it's not the right it's not the right answer, but they are actually socially interacting with that's their right. friends. Sure, so But tomorrow mom and dad are looking to find some structure around here what we're going to try to implement here is outdoor play we'll kind of go back to where what i did when i was a kid to do something outside hopefully we get beautiful days like we got today and we can get out 
it's not just replacing the school day. Most everything else is canceled too, like hours and hours of after school sports. I play basketball for the middle school here, and I play a lot of hockey. I play double A in Bishop's Falls, A here for Bantam, and high school hockey too. Including house league, I have it almost every day except for Saturday, unless I'm on the tournament. It's mini sticks for now, and for mom, it almost feels like her boys are young again. Up until yesterday, or the day before, or last weekend, we were taxis. And now we're, we're, we're right back to when they were babies. We're keeping things going sort of thing, so. And then there's the big question of explaining why. I explained to them that I don't understand everything. I understand that I'm vulnerable. If they understand that their parents are a little bit vulnerable, they feel a little safer to be vulnerable too. And, and I said to them, we should be afraid, but we shouldn't be afraid to panic. We should be afraid to make responsible choices. The same advice you're hearing is the same advice they are hearing. Wash your hands and be careful. Garrett Barry, CBC News, Gander. Well, if it wasn't hard enough to suddenly have the kids at home, many parents are also having to work from home. And dealing with both at the same time is a little hectic. We checked in with two moms to see how it's going. Yeah, so I've set up in the corner of my kitchen, so I'm not really hidden away or anything like that. I, I have a fairly small house, so um, I'm working straight out of the kitchen. The bedroom is nice and tidy. So I am lucky that I've got a little bit of space here that I can kind of set up in my bedroom and have a little distance. But uh, downstairs is pretty chaotic right now because there's no time to be tidying up in between trying to do childcare and working. It's much more hectic. It takes a lot longer sometimes to get things done because you're sort of juggling between working and then also playing um, the mother role as well and, and trying to make sure kids are fed. And as much as you tell them I'm here, but pretend I'm not here. <laughs> I still like to ask questions and um, every now and then they're getting into their arguments and whatnot and need to be uh, have a little bit of refereeing going on. So it makes things much more hectic. I'm much more tired at the end of the day. So I have a five-year-old who uh, is home from kindergarten now and um, obviously I'm taking care of her. And at five, they don't have a particularly long attention span, obviously. So kind of every 20 minutes or so we have to be finding a new task or doing something different um and you know with a small kid obviously you're still doing things like making lunch getting snacks uh, helping out with whatever they need uh, getting milk out of the fridge all those little things i find it is a little bit more difficult to be productive because you're, you're pulled away a bit more um in the office you can sometimes be pulled away too but um, you're still staying focused on work but here I'm being pulled away and, and um, running around the house and then having to come back and get myself back into that mindset. I think probably the thing that I've learned or at least noticed is that most of the advice given to, you know, that's kind of getting out there right now, blogs about how to be productive at home and whatnot, doesn't really apply that well to people with small kids. And there's probably lots of other situations it doesn't apply well to as well. But, you know, this idea that uh, sit down and, you know, work for two hours straight with no distractions so that you can be very productive. That's not happening. So um, I guess what I've learned is that we have to be very flexible and we have to be realistic with ourselves about what we can accomplish. I am starting to get into a routine and even though it, it may be the long haul, but um, I'm just grateful too that given the type of work that I do with Clear Risk and the type of company that we are, that we are being able, or I am being able to help as well fight against this pandemic. I know from talking with my friends, particularly moms, um, they're stressed about the idea that maybe their employer might expect them to be as productive as normal, seeing as they're facilitating work from home. But the reality is, is we have a full-time job with small kids. So um, you know, being realistic and being forgiving with yourself is probably my best advice. And be so good, because it's, it's a job with proper management, can employ thousands and thousands of people, we've been done it, it can be done again. Questions tonight about how shrimp quotas are determined, and those questions come from someone who makes a living in the shrimp industry.
Well, people across the country are being asked to work from home, and that's exactly what Ashley is doing today. She joins us live from her dining room, <laughs> Ashley. So uh, <laughs> what was it like for you today working from home? Uh, the day, first of all, the day flew by. Mm -hmm. uh, second of all, I learned a lesson, and uh, it's when you're working from home, you need to hide all of your chocolate <laughs> because uh, it's pretty easy just to <laughs> snack like, all day long. And then walk into the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> But it was a nice day today outside. Lots of sunshine again. Yeah, it was a, an absolutely beautiful day. Hopefully you got out and uh, enjoyed some of it at least mm -hmm. because uh, that's all about to change uh, as we head through the next, uh, well, now anyway, we're already starting to see some cloud cover move in. Let's take a look at where we sat temperature wise. It was absolutely beautiful with those temperatures just a little bit below zero today. Uh, sitting at minus one as the afternoon high in St. John's, uh, same for Port of Bass, Cornerbrook hovering around the zero degree mark. And we've got those mild temperatures up through Labrador as well, minus two in Makovic and uh, Lab City currently sitting, or rather saw it high near minus seven today. Now, if we take a look at the, the weather systems, what's uh, on the go, we've got that increase in cloud there that is, uh, and we've got some snow happening uh, up through Lab City. And uh, we zoom out a little bit, you can see that little bit of a mess and that's what's headed our way as we head through the overnight tonight. Now I've added those winds again to the future tracker just to show you those winds are going to pick up generally out of the south tonight, certainly along the south coast gusting anywhere from 50 to as much as 80 kilometers per hour. We're going to start to see that snow uh, in and stay within the next hour or so along the south coast and then continue through the overnight to spread across the island up through Labrador. You're going to see your snow already happening in Lab West continue to head towards the coast. Your winds are going to be a little bit breezy as well. 50, uh, 40 to 50 kilometers per hour expected through the overnight tonight. Now by uh, through the overnight, we are going to see the heaviest snow, certainly along the south coast. And your temperatures are going to climb a little bit. So sitting around uh, minus two for you around the south coast, minus four in St. John's. And again, those winds will pick up. So out of the south, 50 to 70 kilometers per hour. Up through Labrador, you'll note those mild temperatures sticking around overnight, minus four for Cartwright, and then temperatures dipping for Lab City around minus 17. You should actually start to see your skies clear after midnight, but your uh, winds are going to shift as well at, uh, to northwesterlies by tomorrow morning. So uh, as we head through the day tomorrow, those winds are going to stay strong, 60 to as much as 80 kilometers per hour. Note that green there in eastern Newfoundland. Most of us should actually see a changeover into the early afternoon to rain, maybe through uh, some uh, ice pellets, but mostly that should be a quick transition. And then things should actually clear right behind it. But those winds will pick up as they shift out of the west uh, for eastern Newfoundland. You're going to see gusts near about 80 kilometers per hour. But again, a quiet uh, as we head into the evening hours. And then it's going to stay generally quiet uh, through the day as well. So there's a look at just the accumulations. Most of it will be along the south coast, 10 to as much as 20 centimeters possible. Otherwise, a good 5 to 10 or somewhere between 5 to 10 centimeters. The eastern portion uh, of Newfoundland, we're looking at uh, a trace to maybe 5 centimeters, not much in the way. Even up through Labrador, your accumulations will be relatively light. But we do have that snowfall warning from Porta Bass to Burgio, and that again is because of the 10 to 20 centimeters that's expected. Now, through the day tomorrow, you'll see those temperatures will climb into the single digits on the plus side of the mercury hovering around the zero or one degree mark along the west coast probably going to see some flurries again into the afternoon with that sun peaking out at times through the day and then for labrador minus 13 for lab city along the coast warmer temperatures uh, but again going to hang on to that chance of flurries you'll probably stay cloudy through the afternoon as well now looking into thursday things quiet down maybe a few flurries along the west coast but those temperatures will drop again below zero through the day uh, minus five for Lab City. And then your long range, uh, really not a whole lot happening. Friday night, we'll start to see the next system move in. And it's going to be a, a fairly large system. It's going to affect most of the uh, province with temperatures climbing into the single digits on the plus side of the mercury by Saturday. Eight degrees, it looks like. So anything that does fall should fall as rain uh, on the, for the day Saturday. And then those temperatures are going to dip into Sunday as well. So minus three for central Newfoundland by the time that happens. For Western Newfoundland, you're looking at a similar temperature on Saturday, but dropping to those minus double digits overnight and then staying below zero through Sunday. 
for eastern Labrador, sunshine by Thursday, and then the rest of the, or heading into the weekend, rather, temperatures are going to be sitting in the minus single digits, but it will be unsettled with periods of snow expected uh, for most of the big land, certainly uh, for Lab West into Saturday, sitting around minus 13. So uh, just wanted to share your weather photo of the day today. Day. This one was sent in by Julie Beggs. This is the sunset at Sandbanks Provincial Park. Oh, so just a great nice. shot there. Yes, yeah, a beautiful a bit of shot there. Social distancing happening there as well. <laughs> it's a great spot to do it. I mean, we do it have uh, on Thursday, you've got some nice weather coming, so you can certainly do that. Beautiful. All right, Ashley. Uh, thanks so much for uh, checking in from at home tonight. And uh, I guess I won't see you tomorrow, but uh, we'll check in with you again tomorrow. <laughs> we'll certainly talk tomorrow. Okay, thanks, Ashley. <laughs> Well, as uh, shrimp quotas for the upcoming season are about to be released, a fisherman in Anchor Point says DFO needs to look at the science because the future of the fishery depends on it. Here and now's Troy Turner reports. A month or so, he is hoping his boat will be sailing with pride, back on the water, harvesting shrimp, just as his skipper has done for 42 years. The herds have all, but it was a family business and and we all wanted to go fishing, and there was times that we took everything. Like weeks, we said we never took a cent. We took 100% just to pay for payments on a boat. Gange is not happy with the way DFO has conducted its stock assessments. I said, why do the shrimp, why do you think the shrimp is doing because of this warm water? And the figures, they're moving. So I said, you see the shrimp is moving because of warm water temperatures. I said, why are you doing surveys in the same place then? I said, don't, what, what do that tell me? You just told me they moved. So you're going to do a survey in the same place if you just move because they got tails on them. They do move. So you're going to go out there now. You're going to tell them there's no one out there. That's how our quota's been getting caught, right? The quota for the area's Genge fishes have dropped consistently over the years. Genge worries the inshore harvesters are taking a backseat to offshore who fish all year round. I don't know where we stand, and it can be so good because it's a, it's a job with proper management. Can employ thousands and thousands of people. We've been done it. It can be done again. Because I don't know where they're going to expect our youth or people to go around the world anymore. There's no jobs, no, no secure jobs, jobs unless he wants everybody to be a doctor. I don't know how many of them he needs out there. Because Genge wants to pass along his enterprise to his son who fishes with him. But he says he can't do that because of the high taxes they'll incur, even if it's a gift. And while he expects the quotas in one of the areas he fishes to remain stable for two seasons, he says the future of the inshore shrimp fishery is not looking good. Troy Turner, CBC News, Cornerbrook. As of right now, we've had no notification from either Global Affairs, with whom I'm registered, or uh, Air Canada on what the situation is with the airlines and trying to get back. Away and worried. Ahead, a Newfoundlander is trying to follow Canada's recommendation to return home, but it isn't easy.
Some major industries in this province are scaling back in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Nalcor said today it's ramping down operations at the Muskrat Falls site in Labrador. Nalcor is stopping construction and putting the site into maintenance and care mode for the next month. About 500 people work at the site, with 350 of them living on the site. And Valet is also winding down its Boise's Bay mining operation in northern Labrador. The company canceled flights to and from the site yesterday, and flights will stay canceled until they start a screening process. Here now is Terry Roberts spoke with Matthew Pike, who handles Indigenous Affairs for Valet. Okay, so we're joined now by Matthew Pike. He's the Aboriginal uh, Affairs uh, Superintendent with Valet. Now, you've taken the dramatic step, uh, I guess, compared to what other uh, major projects are doing in the province. You're actually suspending mining operations and also uh, shutting down construction, I guess, of your expansion project. Why have you taken that uh, significant step? Uh, this decision, uh, obviously, is a significant decision made, but it is made uh, with people at the, at the forefront, the health of all of our employees, and then focusing on uh, stopping, uh, stopping or preventing as best we can the transmission of COVID-19 uh, to the new Nazivut and Inu communities. Now, I understand there are uh, roughly the 400 uh, Indigenous workers uh, at Boise's Bay. So what kind of consultations did you have with the new Nazivut government and the uh, Labrador Inu leadership before you made this decision? Uh, before this, was, this plan was finalized, uh, I had uh, phone calls with the Inu Nation leadership and the new Nazivut government to go over our plans, go over our recommendation for action. Uh, I wouldn't want to speak on their behalf, but we received uh, positive feedback to our plan. Uh, and then we uh, last evening decided to pull the trigger with all the consultation uh, done at that time uh, and with support of our, our Aboriginal partners in Boise's Bay. Now, you've, you've said this is a, right now this is a four-week suspension of activities. I understand there's about 900 workers there uh, at Boise's Bay. So how do you plan to, uh, how long will it take to get them out of there? No, so right now on site, we have around 800 employees. Uh, we, usually on a normal day, Monday to Friday, we have three Dash 8s and, uh, and a Twin Otter that, uh, that fly into site and fly out of site. Uh, so mostly empty planes are going to site today to, to, take, people, uh, to take people home. Uh, we're going into care and maintenance mode for four weeks. Uh, what that means is essentially we're uh, ensuring the, uh, the assets are protected, uh, that when, when this uh, virus passes and we're ready to resume operations, that... Uh, for the operations side, we're ready to go back into the open pit, and for construction, we're ready to resume construction. Uh, so it's uh, it, it's going to take around 10 days to to safely ramp down. So we're getting as many people, non-essential people, off-site as we speak, uh, and then the uh, the people, employees looking after the assets. Uh, that, those are the people that we're going to keep on site and, and rotate through. Uh, but uh, in terms of employees from the uh, five new Nazi of it communities and the two Labrador Inu communities. Uh, what we're saying to those employees and residents of those communities is to stay home. Uh, we're going to be stopping travel from those communities to take that drastic action to prevent uh, any any travel back and forth between our site uh, and the communities. Boise's Bay employees will be compensated their wages for the next four weeks. Uh, four weeks allows us the time to uh, figure out what's going on, to, to put a plan in place and to see where this virus takes us. All right, Matthew Pike with uh, Valet, we thank you for your time. Thank you, Terry. Well, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has put out the call for Canadians to come home from abroad. But for some, it's easier said than done. Former Cornerbrook Mayor Charles Pender is in Florida and is trying to get home, but has faced some roadblocks, and he joins us now through FaceTime. So, Mr. Pender, what is your situation right now? Well, we're uh, in uh, Florida and we're trying to get home by Air Canada, which is uh, proving to be a uh, bit of a challenge. Uh, we have a couple puppies with us, so uh, we have to ensure that we all get back safely. And as of right now, we've had no notification from either Global Affairs, with whom I'm registered, or uh, Air Canada on what the situation is with the airlines and trying to get back. So why is it difficult to get a flight now? It, are they just all booked up? Well, I'm originally supposed to go back on the 29th of March, and uh, as of Monday, I guess, with the Prime Minister saying he's, you know, saying Canadians should come home pretty well, uh, we tried to uh, book a flight. The earliest one I could get 
uh, yesterday morning was for Friday, but I'm with my sister and she came via different uh, routes. So we're trying to get back on the same flights because of the dog. And uh, when I looked yesterday morning, it was $368. And after some checking, I went back yesterday afternoon and it was $2,100 uh, business class fares. And the earliest I could get one was Friday. Then next it was Monday. And uh, even the economy fares are now $90. So the price is just going through the roof. And uh, with uh, the government saying that airlines may cancel flights, I'm not even sure if I bought one now or paid for one that I could actually get the flight home. Wow. So what are you going to do? Well, we have a vehicle uh, here, so we're going to drive uh, tomorrow morning. We're going to leave and uh, drive up through uh, uh, New York and so on and on through Maine and uh, cross over the New Brunswick border. And then hopefully Marine Atlantic is still operating. They say they are, and we'll take the ferry across. Do you have any concerns <laughs> about getting across the border, about the ferry being canceled while you're en route uh, to the island? Well, you know, I mean, ferries get canceled all the time, uh, temporarily. So we hope, you know, if there's any weather or something like that, that's all we have to worry about. But uh, getting across the border, the prime minister says, and the Americans say that the border is still open for Canadians. So uh, we shouldn't have any trouble uh, going back into Canada. And uh, once we're there, we hopefully can get the ferry and go across. So what is the mood like where you are right now? I guess a lot of people are talking about this. Uh, what's, what's the word on the street? What are people saying to each other? Yeah, it's, uh, it's sort of changed over the last week. It's really ramped up. And, uh, you know, a week ago, there wasn't much talk about it, but now everybody's talking about it. Uh, you hear it on the local news uh, constantly. Uh, all of the uh, bars, restaurants, things like that are either shut down or shutting down. Uh, public gatherings have all been canceled. Uh, in the uh, park where we're to, it's just an RV park. Uh, all the gatherings here and all the, you know, events and so on have all been canceled. And everybody's just keeping their distance. So if you walk into somebody, they say, okay, we'll just keep our distance. And, you know, we're all washing our hands and using sanitizer and wipes everywhere we go and uh, in supermarkets and so on. So, uh, and, you know, we, we avoid crowds and that kind of thing. So, yeah, everybody's aware of it. Uh, I don't think everybody's panicking yet, but uh, it's certainly a, a serious concern. And then add to that, trying to get home on top of it, it just, uh, it just makes it a little more difficult. How are, are you feeling about it all? Are you anxious to get home? Yeah, I don't normally panic. I mean, I've traveled a lot. These things happen. Uh, this is the first time I've seen this uh, extent, I guess, when you talk about pandemic. I, I was in France when they had the uh, SARS, so uh, we sort of went through that. It was nothing like this. We even had better information back then, I think. Uh, so just the information, lack of information. You know, normally when you're traveling Air Canada, if there's change in your flight, you get, you know, five or six emails. Haven't heard a peep out of Air Canada. Haven't heard anything from the government of Canada. So, uh, we're just, you know, looking at trusted news sources, the CBC, or, you know, we try to look at the government site every day, but nothing's changing there. And uh, we'll just uh, get the best information we can and, and deal with it as we go. All right. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us. And uh, good luck to you, your family, and your puppies uh, getting home. Uh, I hope it's a safe trip for you. Thanks very much. I'm sure we'll be fine. Thank you. Well, now, not every Canadian abroad will be able to get home. That's the message from the Prime Minister today. Here's what Justin Trudeau had to say to Canadians like the Penders, who are currently outside the country. We are looking at every possible way of bringing Canadians home. Uh, there are three million Canadians at any given moment uh, around the world living and working. And I think it is just realistic to know that there are some of them who will not be coming home in the coming weeks. Uh, but we will make measures available through Global Affairs Canada, loans and supports. We're working with airlines to try and make sure that as many Canadians as possible, as many Canadians as want to, can come home.
All dental clinics in the province have suspended regular services for the next two weeks. This in an attempt to limit the spread of COVID-19. Dentists will see patients in an emergency. Here and now's Heather Gillis spoke with the association's communications manager this afternoon. So right now we have been informed that a lot of our members are taking this opportunity to have professionals come in and clean their offices. So this is to deeply sanitize everything and anything that was in high traffic areas such as the waiting room, they're simply disposing of it. So magazines and books and things like that. Um, dentists always have sanitary measures in place. This is extremely important for infection control. So they are continuing to do this. Um, they are continuing to clean and then uh, wipe down counters, surfaces, their chairs, and they're doing this even more frequently than ever. So what should someone do if they have a dental emergency? So as of right now, we have sent out a member notice and asked that they all set a protocol in place to have a specific number that they send out to their patients. In the meantime, though, they can always call the office directly. Um, the office manager will set up an appointment as soon as possible. If they get the voicemail, please leave a message um, and they will get back to you very shortly because they are monitoring this as well. Now, the head of the Dental Association and two others from this province are in isolation after attending a conference in Vancouver. Multiple people at that conference have tested positive for the coronavirus. Squires says the head of the association has tested negative for the virus. Well, to BC now, where COVID-19 has killed a total of four people. All of those deaths stem from an outbreak at an understaffed seniors center in North Vancouver. And families aren't just struggling with the sickness, they're also fear for those inside. And I want to go back in for my dad, but I'm worried for myself and my son. Kelly Shillard is staying in as a precaution after attending to her 81-year-old father last week, who lives at the Lynn Valley Care Centre. I was one of the family members who was in now uh, helping to make sure that people who were in the home got, got fed. A dozen health care workers there have tested positive. Now, a total of four residents have died. My dad is okay so far. He's really um, anxious and he doesn't want to take his pills anymore. And he said that he's done. And I think part of it is just the fact that he's stuck in his room now for over a week. A tough situation for a guy who loves dancing and being outside. But at least for now, the rules allow Shillard's sister to be with him. Everything is happening here so quickly. We spoke to her from outside the care home, which she says is short-staffed but doing their best. These people that are coming into work, and some of them are working 16 to 18 hours a day, they are resilient and amazing. Because of the outbreak, residents are kept in their rooms, and starting today, visitors are only allowed into long-term care homes in B.C. if it's end-of-life care or under strict rules. How important it is for us to come together as a community, to connect on a daily basis at least with, with the people in our community who are in isolation and who aren't able um, to have visitors. And those are the people Shillard worries about the most. And I'm worried about people dying alone. That's what I'm worried about. I'm so grateful that my sister is there with my dad. But there are a lot of people that have nobody in there. And that's what I'm the most worried about. I'm sorry. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, North Vancouver.
Three provinces have announced states of emergency. On Monday, Prince Edward Island declared a public health emergency, and today, both Alberta and Ontario made their own declarations. We're facing an unprecedented time in our history. This is a decision that was not made lightly. COVID-19 constitutes a danger of major proportions. We're taking this measure because we must offer our full support and every power possible to help our healthcare sector fight the spread of COVID-19. Ontario is reporting 190 cases of COVID-19. That's the highest in the country. There's been one death in the province linked to the virus. The state of emergency closes most public facilities and limits public gatherings. It also closes bars, but allows restaurants to serve takeout food only. And with the school closures, travel restrictions, and constant news updates, the uncertainty can all be a bit overwhelming. And for many parents, it also means calming the worries of their kids. Tashana Reed has that story. Brothers Noah and Levi Rachmel are keeping busy. The next three weeks will be a lot like this. How come you guys won't be able to go to school? Because coronavirus is taking over the world. I'm scared that I'm not like get it and it won't go away. Like many kids, coronavirus is on their minds. Have mom and dad been been helping you when you, when you do feel worried? Yeah. Yeah, they'll either be like they'll either like give me a hug or say don't worry. It's a scary reality, and not just for them. For mom and dad too. It's been really unprecedented in our lives obviously to deal with something like this. I don't think you can help but be anxious as things are progressing the way that they are. Maybe. Parents Michael Rachmel and Laura Chadola pulled the plug on their March break trip to Ottawa. With uncertainty in the air, they've been trying to keep calm and reassure their boys. We're wanting to let our kids know that it is serious, but maybe not giving them all of the detail. So, how much should you tell your kids? Child and teen psychiatrist Rachel Mitchell says if your kids are young, just stick to the facts. Avoid abstract concepts. Keep it short, keep it brief. Ask them what they know already. Answer only what they ask. If you have a teenager, talk to them like they're an adult. And her advice for parents, be aware of the impact of your own anxiety. Your anxiety rubs off on your child. If you were calm, they are more likely to be calm. What are some of the things that... For Noah and Levi, despite some worries, they're happy to share what they've learned. Wash your hands. Wash your hands a lot and not put their pinkies or any kind of finger in their mouth. For now, the Rackmills say they're keeping things honest and positive at home and will take things one day at a time. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. Well, with everything that's going on, you may not have noticed, but uh, today is St. Patrick's Day. Across the province, celebrations are mostly cancelled, but one group, Shani Ganuk, will be playing its 26th straight Paddy's Day show. It's a concert without a crowd, but with a purpose. Uh, tonight at 8.30, uh, we'll have uh, uh, a concert here at my home here in Logie Bay. There won't be any audience. Uh, it'll just be the band and the uh, camera people. But we're going to do that on Facebook Live, and uh, hopefully we can provide some good entertainment for St. Patrick's Day and also raise some awareness and some funds that are very much needed for the Newfoundland and Labrador Food Sharing Association. And we'll have all the info there tonight where you can donate and you can give if you can. If you can't, that's fine too. Just come enjoy the show. But uh, we understand this is uh, unprecedented times, uh, but we do know how resilient Newfoundland and Labradorians are. And we know that we can do this and we can beat this. And if we all uh, act together and we, we work together, this, we can do this.
Welcome back. Well, that wraps up uh, tonight's edition of Here and Now. Thanks so much for uh, sharing part of your evening with us. And you can stay up to date with all the latest news about the coronavirus on our website at cbc.ca slash NL. And uh, we've gotten a few calls from uh, people watching the show to our newsroom saying that, uh, you know, you can still go outdoors and have a walk as long as you keep uh, your distance from other people. So I hope you have a great night.